This is Rob Brettle, snake handler, <laughs> crop wrangler, animal expert. Rob is best known for his crocodile shows, where he performs the unthinkable eight times a day. His innate ability to sense how wild and dangerous animals will act keeps him one step ahead of tragedy. He claims to still having all ten fingers and ten toes, so he must know something we don't. Well, he does. Rob may look reckless, but daily he applies the intricate skills he learned in the University of the Great Outdoors. And so he can be forgiven for sometimes taking all the hype about saltwater crocodiles with a grain of salt. Wow, isn't that exciting? Seen here in 1960s film footage, Rob was raised in the Australian outback and developed a love of reptiles and many other animals through the guidance of his herpetologist father, Joe Brettle. That's Rob in the middle with his brothers Joe Jr. and John. He gained this bush education by helping his father gather a collection of snakes and lizards that eventually formed the nucleus of Breddell's Wildlife Park in Renmark, South Australia. Later in life, they started Australia's first successful crocodile farm in the far north of Australia. Rob Breddell, crocodile wrangler, was born. I'll walk around him. It's Rob's understanding of the saltwater crocodile that has brought him fame, an animal he believes is one of the most misunderstood on the planet. One of the most important things I learnt about handling crocodiles was the splash. Barramundi fishermen always used to complain about the crocodiles taking fish from their nets, but I noticed it was always the fish on the surface that were splashing that were taken. So I experimented with splashing with a stick. If I splash over there, He'll go over to there. If I splash over here, he'll actually come over to here. Now, he, he was over there, he's coming now. They always go to the splash. Even though he can see me, he will still attack the end of the stick. You watch. You come on. Gotcha. No second chances. So I found that even though they could see me, and get me, they always went for the splash. They were almost totally predictable. I found they were not cunning or conniving in any sense of the imagination. Come and I'll show you. <laughs> Crocodiles do basically all of their hunting in the water. On the land here, I can come up to him. I can actually scratch him on the nose if I like. Kick him in his butt wander out his territory, but never, never jump in his kitchen and splash. That's a no-no. Like this. Imagine if Rob was a swimmer going for a quick dip. In the majority of croc attacks on humans, alcohol is involved. You can imagine a loud splash and drunk makes an easy meal for a saltwater croc. He didn't like that. He wanted to eat me. Rob's mission in life is to educate people about the many fascinating yet dangerous creatures that inhabit our planet. Back it up. Comes again. So when he knows he can reach me quickly, I'll look. Watch again. Even with those jaws of death coming so close, Rob is in calm control. An expert animal tracker and handler, he can catch and play with the fiercest nature offers at any size. You are, aren't you? <laughs> gotcha. We're going to trace Rob Reddle's footsteps from outback boy to man of the land. Whether he's tackling massive animals that have already tackled others, or simply surviving alone in the bush by living fat on rat. Rob takes us face to face with a killer instinct. After seeing me in action, many people think, is he mystical or is he mad? Now, I know I'm not mystical and I don't think I'm mad. Everything I do is basically under control. Now, what I did is just watch how the animal hunted and how he defended himself. And then I used those instincts against him or as I call to my advantage. I know exactly what they can do and can't do. So 
what I do is done in relative safety. Almost 100% predictable. Handling the world's deadliest animals requires more than instinct. It takes years of observation and practice. For Rob Brittle, these skills were developed from a very young age. It started in the outback town of Renmark, South Australia, where, after migrating from Europe, Rob's father, Joe, started his backyard reptile collection. Here, the family pets were pythons, lizards, and poisonous snakes. The years have worn on, but the house Rob grew up in still holds fond memories. That there is the first snake house my dad built for the crocodile and all the tropical snakes that had to be heated. The second one's over there. Now, my brother and I were so glad when that got built because we actually got that one as our bedroom. Their father's love of animals was passed on to their sons, whether they liked it or not, though they seemed to like it. The very first crocodile my father got when I was 11 was on one of his trips, and he didn't think of where he'd put it when he got it home. So while he was building a cage for this thing, he had to put it right here in front of Mum's stove. Isn't that right, Mum? <laughs> they got preference in this house, didn't they? Yeah. The animal's always first. <laughs> yeah, but first, yeah. We always come back and then. Yeah. Joe Brittle's collection grew until he opened a wildlife park, now managed by Rob's brother, Peter. <laughs> Having been brought up with snakes since we were little kids, we've got absolutely no fear of them. In fact, what we found out was that nearly everything we'd ever heard about them wasn't true. In fact, my father used to actually put snakes into the bed with us to keep them warm. Now, these are anacondas and bioconstrictors that do have a bad reputation movie-wise but very few of these animals actually do get big enough to be dangerous to humans. They do, however, get big enough to attack small prey animals and all use the same killing method, crushing constriction. All snakes have a breathing tube to allow them to continue breathing when swallowing such large prey. Even at a young age, Rob and his brothers were handling pythons. Brittles, these constrictors were treated like family pets. Some people take their dogs for a walk. I take my snakes much more leisurely. What do you mean feed them tourists? I reckon. <laughs> a prized python in the Brittle snake enclosure is also the world's most dangerous, the reticulated python. This potential man-eater can only be handled while firmly wrapped around a meal. Look, she won't let go. Okay, get your foot out. Oh. Holy hell. Well, we're moving, see, so she thinks we're alive. It's <laughs> still alive. We'll have to help her out of the skin too, Peter. Yeah. Around 25 years ago, my father got a baby reticulated python about two feet long. This is the end result, 25 years down the track. I can hang on to this snake like this only because he's got a mouth full of feed. You can't do this when he's hungry. If he grabs you and wraps you up, that's it. He's over 100 kilos. He's heavier than I am. There's just no way you can handle this snake. Now, they're not, they've not only got a tail, I'll show you a few other things about them. Even this potential man-eater requires some tender, loving care. If I've got time, I always like to help a big python shed its skin. Now, big pythons tend to shed their skin in bits and pieces, where the smaller pythons will do it in one whole piece and the little bits hanging on seem to irritate them. They've got very, very sensitive skin, as you can see. Bites from smaller pythons, they're acceptable. One about this size, with 80 huge teeth. <laughs> You're not gonna let me see them. Look at down here. It's just still alive, there's a problem. That gets coming up, so it's probably this way now. 80 huge teeth. Grooming also needs to take place in the more hard to reach and sharper areas. There's one tooth. They lose their teeth and regrow them. Imagine 80 of those going into your body somewhere with 100 kilos of snake on the other end of it. For a man who never thinks twice about handling man-eating crocs and snakes, it's funny to watch Rob on the run from a cranky, fat old wombat.
nearly got me, he did. I'll stick to the crocodile. <laughs> The Australian bush is an inhospitable place. Scorching temperatures during the day are matched by near freezing drops at night. For the Breddles, this was paradise. Renmark is Aboriginal for red mud, and it was in the red soils that surround Rob's hometown of Renmark, South Australia, that he learned his remarkable animal tracking skills. Just what do we mean by killer instinct? To me, it's the way an animal locates and catches its food or prey. When I'm in the bush, I use those same rules. I look for signs, and they're everywhere. When I went hunting with my brother and my father for lizards, we used to have a competition to see who could find the most lizards. And I learnt very quickly that you had to dig up the right hole, and that's the one that had the fresh tracks on it. Rob uses an old bush tool, a stick, to sense how deep the lizard is. It also shows me which direction the hole's going. It's going around that way. The red sandy soil makes for easy digging. Rob carefully feels in the sand, as one wrong swipe of the shovel could end a little reptile's life. It's home. <laughs> It's a painted dragon, just what I thought it would have been. Now this little dragon lizard is probably the most common little dragon in Australia. And he's food for just about anything out there that eats lizards. But then he also eats other little things that are smaller than him. I'm bigger, I'm bigger. Hey, I'm bigger. Remember this, I'm bigger. In defence, he'll even bite me. That made my eyes water, I can tell you. <laughs> Ooh, even drew blood. <laughs> it was the search for the mighty King Brown Snake that drew Rob and his father into the bush, like prospectors looking for a hidden treasure. I've just found a King Brown Snake over here. Now, when we were kids, we used to come out here with my father into this desert region and spent countless weekends just searching for the King Brown snake. The King Brown is one of the ten most dangerous snakes in the world because of the high amount of venom it injects in a single bite. To my father, this snake in this area was the diamond of snakes. And there were always stories of that eight-footer as fat as a beer bottle, the 12-carat one. But unfortunately, he never got one. They're always around about this size or a little bit bigger. I just pop him in the bag. Get off of there. There are more than 80 species of poisonous snakes in Australia, at least five on a list of the world's 10 most dangerous. The most prevalent species near the Brettle property is the common tiger snake, the fourth most deadly snake in the world. The very first poisonous snake I ever caught was a tiger snake when I was 11 on my way to school. Now I spent many a year through these areas looking for tiger snakes. They were the most common snake here. And in one day, my father and my brother caught 64 on one island in four hours. Now the reason we caught so many tiger snakes back then was they were actually needing them for venom research and anti-venom. On one of these trips, my father grabbed this big tiger snake by the tail and said, look at this beauty. I won't say what he said because it was hanging off his hand. He had to grab it by the head and pull it off. That tiger snake nearly killed him. That's why I don't tail handle snakes. I catch him with the jigger behind the head, safe way. And it isn't only the snakes that are poisonous in the outback. This is a scorpion hole. A crescent shaped hole is always a scorpion hole. These nocturnal creatures are fantastic diggers creating a deep hole far away from the sun-baked surface. Rob will now carefully slide his hand under the scorpion. Even if he was to be stung, this sand scorpion is relatively harmless to humans, but can deliver the equivalent of a bad wasp sting. He's a little bit angry, he's in the strike pose. 
but the hand under him just feels like earth to him. He's not too worried. If you have to handle a scorpion, I find this the best way. Just let him sit on your hand, but put the other hand over him very gently. You'll quieten down. Following an army posting to northern Queensland and a tour of duty in Vietnam, Rob decided to leave the desert area of Renmark for the paradise he still calls home, where the rainforest meets the Great Barrier Reef. Saltwater crocodiles control these estuaries, while freshwater crocs patrol the inland waterways. I fell in love with the rainforests of North Queensland when I came up here with my father on my first collecting trip when I was 11. In that one month, we caught more reptiles than he had in his entire zoo. And I loved Tarzan movies like any young kid would have. And if I was to actually be Tarzan and wrestle big crocodiles and catch giant pythons, it was going to have to be here in the jungles of North Queensland. Rob's now in search of one of those pythons, the carpet snake. They shelter in crevices or hollows provided by rocks and trees. They hunt medium-sized animals like rats and possums, as well as sleeping birds. Wow, we've got one. Come on, lady. That's good. I caught my first carpet snake near here on that first trip with my father. Now, in southern Australia, in the dry country where I live, if you wanted to catch a carpet snake, you'd have to go for months every weekend and still not be guaranteed of catching one. But here in the rainforest, you will find a carpet snake in a day. But on the way there, you'll also find a green tree snake, a brown tree snake, maybe a black snake, blue tongue lizard, a water dragon. And if you're near a creek, you might even see a crocodile. Life in the rainforest is just so visible when you compare it to the desert. Having spent much of my time in the bush, it was inevitable that I was going to get stranded by a broken down motor or the weather. Now I looked forward to it because I always wondered how I would survive on that bush tucker. Now, I always went prepared. I always had a knife, a fishing line, or a gun. I spent two years with an Aboriginal 65 years of age, and he never took food with him. He always lived off the bush, so I watched him, and I gained a lot of experience of how to find this stuff. If you happen to get lost in the Australian bush today, it's easier to get a feed than ever before because now we've got pigs, goats, rabbits and rats, yes, rats, and that's what I'm looking for. When you're out in the bush getting bush tucker, you've got to be a bit careful when you catch animals so you don't get injured. Now this thing could bite me fingers and it's no good having an infected finger out here. So I've got to be very, very quick. That's him. Short and sweet. With one part of the meal in the shopping bag, Rob now looks for tasty mangrove snails. And for main course, he's going to choose the very nippy mud crab. It's self-service in the bush, and if you've got this shopper's keen eye, you can spot the signs for the best tucker. The mud crab also lives down holes, and if they're down in the hole, it'll be dirty. It's clearer over there. I can see some tracks here as well, and there's movement. Oh, look at that. Just had his swimmer up. He's actually digging the hole. Now, to catch them like this, you've got to be very careful. You can put your hand into the water and go down the hole, but you've got to do it very, very, very carefully, gently. And feel his big claw there and his back. He's burying himself really good down into there. I've got to get around him as best I can. Okay. Lucky the mud's a bit soft and I can actually. Just about got him. Gotcha. Come on. Gotcha. Come on. Come on. God. He's a big fella too. There he is. Now, what actually did, he was sitting down with his claws basically against his body trapped in his hole. I just stuck my hand down over his back, felt very gently, come down further, then slipped it over here, grabbed him on his paws like that, and once you're like that, he can't hurt you. I just pulled him very gently out of the hole like that. Dinner. Now, there are many ways to light a fire 
in the bush. I've done it with a battery, an outboard motor, matches that they get wet. I've seen it done with two sticks, but I prefer a cigarette lighter. Here's a feast Rob caught earlier. Rob says it's more surf and turf than reef and beef. Waiting for the appliances to warm up, he contemplates the cooking order and method. To prepare the rat, you've got to singe them first. You cook everything with its skin on out here. It holds the moisture in. Don't look too pretty. I'll take him out here again. OK, now you can just rub all that hair off. You don't worry about taking the gut out because it'll actually just curl up into a little ball. You can throw it away later. So the meat doesn't taste that much different to chicken. And they're supposed to be very, very high in vitamin C. Now I'll just cook him on the coals when it drops down a bit further. I'm going to prepare the fish for you now. Now I've got too much food to eat, so I don't need the whole fish. I'm going to do the specialty of fish sausage. You take the gut and the gills out. You gut the fish, throw the fish away, and you keep the gut. What you do is you poke this gut through its gills, basically turning it inside out. Gets rid of whatever the fish had in his stomach and puts the liver and any fat the fish had inside the sausage. There it is. You cook that. If it's a very fatty fish, all the fat goes inside, and in a while that's pure energy. Crab's very simple, comes in his own pot. We just put him in and cook him gently on the coals. The shellfish, or natural, or cook. I prefer mine cooked. And they come in their own little pots too. I just poke them in around the edge. A bit of the sand over them. That'll help cook them a bit quicker. I can hear that rat sizzling away. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. We've got to feed. Well, the fish sausage is cooked. Looks pretty gross. Tastes pretty gross too. But it's supposed to be very nutritious. <laughs> now some of the foods the Aboriginals ate, I just couldn't eat. But out there, you can't be too fussy. But I can. <laughs> I've got crab. <laughs> as well as these little shells, they're ready also. A bit hot though. Just let them out here cool off a bit. I'll spin the rat again. He won't be too long either, actually. Ooh, it's a little bit warm still. But they're cooked. Entree, mangrove snail. Mm. Not bad. Nice meaty piece in there. Look at that, hey? Main course barbecued mud crab. That is nice. Let's get him back a bit. And for dessert, slow-cooked wild rat. A little bit fiddly, but nice. Perfection. So much for the bush tucker. I must home and have a decent meal. By the early 70s, the Australian saltwater crocodile had been hunted to the brink of extinction. Its hide and teeth sought after fashion accessories. 
The Brittles believed the only way to save the species in the wild was to farm them like livestock. In 1972, Joe Brittle established Australia's first crocodile farm. His second son would manage it. It was the life challenge Rob had been waiting for. When I first arrived in Edward River back in 1972, I believed everything that I'd heard about crocodiles was true. In fact, they were quite intelligent, calculating beasts, even able to run faster than a horse for up to 50 metres. Now, nothing was further from the truth. In fact, on collecting my first couple of nests, I discovered that I could actually run faster backwards than a crocodile could come forwards. And to my relief, the bigger they were, the slower they became. That was the beginning of me becoming master of the beast. Rob learned this important lesson while retrieving eggs from crocodile nests. Female crocs are at their most aggressive while nesting. Yet, as this young mother illustrates, they are no chance of running down a grown man. Rob wondered if this, the most basic of croc facts, was fiction, one of the fallacies existed. The crocodile farmer became the crocodile student as Rob began observing, experimenting and learning from this majestic reptile. What I'm going to show you here is how predictable the crocodile is. Now I'm going to drag one up here for you by splashing. Now they've got tremendously good sensors that can feel splashing in the water and come right to where you are. Even though he's really, really close, he won't come yet till he's close enough to actually make the attack. He's right here now, as you can see. Rob learned this lesson while cleaning crocodile pens. He would tease the crocs, dangling his foot in the clear water, taking it away at the last possible second. Now, you can see that his eyes are open. I can actually put my hand in the water if I like. You see, nothing happens. I'll take the piece of meat. I'll put it in the water as well. That's his dinner. You'll see nothing happens. Until I splash, watch. Straight away has a go at it. Now I'm gonna play Skippy with the crocodile. Come on, don't go yet. Come on. Is this crocodile Skippy? Come on. Yeah, come on, you can do it. And this one was caught 13 years ago. He's a wild crocodile, people. Okay, you can have it now. Now when I give it to him, you'll see he'll take it gentle because it's dead. There's no reason to kill it. Come on. Here it is, here it is. Total predictability. I wouldn't do this if it wasn't like that. From his early days, Rob realised that for crocs to be saved, more than the bounty hunter's guns would need to be silenced. The saltwater crocodile had, and still has, a nasty reputation, which Rob continues to help demystify through hands-on education. The more crocodiles I caught, the quicker I learnt that there were certain places you could be very close to a big crocodile and still be safe. But there are rules. You first of all have to make sure the crocodile is big enough so he can't come around and bite your leg. And you actually have to be sitting right across his back legs. Otherwise, you lose your head or your arm. You get no second chances. How I learnt to sit on a crocodile is a little bit of a hairy story. I was catching crocodiles and I was coming back with three of them in the boat one night. One was 11 feet long, 3.25 metres, and we got swamped. So I parked the boat on the bank, stripped off, took the two small crocs to the top, went back to make sure the girl was okay, but I didn't realise that the water had swelled the rope around her mouth and it had come undone. So when I stood around like this, I went up this and she went whack, and she actually came and hit me in the side of my hips and took me jocks down. Any smaller, and then she would have had me cheek. Luckily enough, she was just over that size. So I found that over three and a half metres, you're reasonably safe. Sitting on a deadly salty is one thing. Kissing it is another. Now how I learnt to kiss a crocodile was, if you can get him in a position like this, if the water's not too deep, I'll actually take him on his chin for you. Get him to close his little eyeballs. He hasn't got enough water to come forward, that's all. Open big, come on, open nice and big, come on, open big, open big, open big. Thank you. 
looking back, when I was younger at the beginning of the crocodile farm, I was basically ego driven. I wouldn't back down. But I soon learnt that to survive, I had to evolve and learn about them, otherwise I might become extinct, like that crocodile nearly was. Rob Brittle's Wildlife Park has a legendary status. Visitors from around the globe come here to see the famous bushmen handle the killers of the animal world. Free handling poisonous snakes might look quite spectacular, but there's really no mysteries to it. Even though these collet snakes are 20 times more deadly than the diamondback rattlesnake, they're one of the easiest snakes to free handle because they are not a nervous snake. Rob has over a hundred snakes at his wildlife park, including the three most deadly snakes on the planet. The prey for the coastal taipan is the bandicoot and the black rat. Compared to the size of the snake, they're fairly formidable prey animals. To hunt these creatures, the snake has had to develop a very highly aggressive and defensive nature, so it makes him a very nervous snake. It's very rare for the coastal taipan to strike but not inject venom. Rob has been the very lucky recipient of two such dry bites. There are correct ways for the experienced to handle such deadly snakes, and Rob stresses it is for the experienced only, including free handling. This is a taipan, but it's the inland taipan. It is in fact the deadliest snake in the world. It is 890 times more deadly than a diamondback rattlesnake but by nature, it's a very placid snake. Most people don't free handle these ones because if an accident does happen, it's a very potent sort of a snake. I'm more nervous than the snake is. Understandably, most tourists to Australia tend to avoid snakes like the taipan. They seek out the warm and fuzzy creatures like the kangaroo. Although roos appear docile at wildlife parks, they can turn nasty in the wild. My father was a kangaroo shooter, and other than snakes and lizards, the very first animals I came into contact with were kangaroos. Now, despite them being Australia's best known icon and looking pretty cute and cuddly, they can be dangerous. In fact, to defend themselves, kangaroos stand up, grab you with the front legs, balance on their tails and kick down with their back legs on two claws. They can also hit with these claws on the front feet as well. They're sharp and they're very muscular animals. Now all this is done is basically in self-defense. They're not aggressive animals at all. But if you corner a kangaroo, you can be in trouble. And dogs, if you have a dog and the dog chases the kangaroo and he bails up, you can be in trouble. In fact, people have been badly injured by kangaroos. You grab one on the hind leg like that, take them off balance, you can then sort of handle a kangaroo quite easily. Now, when they fight you, they stand up, grab you with their front legs and kick you with those two back legs. I don't want to upset him because if I do, one of us is going to be in trouble. Another seemingly harmless creature is the emu. Many believe it to be timid, but it is in fact very territorial and will attack to protect its young. The towering bird appears menacing, but the phrase bird brain exists for a reason. Rob strikes an emu pose, his hands stretched high above his head. As long as he holds it there, the bird will run away. Even emus can be dangerous. Now, with most animals out there, it's size. If I can make myself look bigger, then I win. It's as simple as that. Now, emus kick both forwards and backwards. So if you do have to handle an emu, you come in from the side. You put one arm under their front, one arm behind their legs, you can pick them up like that. Emus are naturally curious, attracted to shiny objects like buttons. If you get attacked by emus, all you have to do is lay down. All they can do is peck you and walk over you. 
<laughs> that ain't hurt too much. It's a slow death. <laughs> <laughs> That's more comfortable. What happened to any of you people ever seen anybody sit on a crocodile before? Oh, thought you would have. Nothing strikes primal fear in a human's heart like now, a crocodile. Is a safe spot. But Rob Brittle doesn't believe it should be that way. Dead. Public opinion says these beasts are incredibly aggressive, always ready to attack. Rob and his unique way proves differently. <laughs> yeah, <got him. laughs> Come on now, this way. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Oh, hang on, we might have smoke on now, what do you reckon? <laughs> Rob's croc shows are designed to educate as well as entertain, and he certainly has a way of getting his message across. Rob's only protection in these shows is a bucket and a stick. The bucket acts as a visual prop. It's the stick that keeps the croc at bay. As you might have noticed by now, I have a love for crocodiles but my fondness for them is a little different to their fondness for me. They want me inside. Now, I realised very early that if I was going to actually deal with these animals, I'd have to find ways of doing it. And I noticed that crocodiles do most of their hunting using their eyesight. They also fight each other by hitting each other head to head in a karate chop sort of a style. So I developed this method of controlling him with a stick. All I'm doing is being another crocodile. Close his eyeballs if I don't want him to see me. I can touch him. Bang, bang to make him go the other way. There are incredible risks to Rob's line of work, as Big Gallopin is about to show us. Rob finishes filming this piece to camera, then Gallopin strikes. <laughs> It all happens in a split second. Rob kept Gallopin's eyes closed with the stick, but his foot inadvertently brushed the big croc's side, allowing it to pinpoint its prey. It's Peter's job as Rob's spotter to protect him, much like a rodeo clown during a bull run. He quickly rushes to Rob's aid, distracting the big croc. Docator again. <laughs> Just one piece. And it was only one tooth, a glancing blow by crocodile standards. Rob finds time to drop into the medical centre to clean and stitch the wound. The Ellie Beach community is very small, and from the looks of it, Doctor isn't too surprised to see Rob walk through her door. <laughs> Doing this filming in the last shot of the last day, we got a bit lax is what happened. Okay. Just a bit lax. Now I've been tasted by nearly every crocodile I've got. I yes. never had one from him before. When it actually got me, I didn't feel a thing, actually. I only noticed when I looked at it, I felt it, but it had nothing else. There's no pain, nothing. Pain sets in uh, 15, 20 minutes later. Next day, Rob got together with Peter for a post-mortem. I always tell my workers that crocodiles are almost totally predictable. And I'm right. Now, when the incident happened, hadn't I had a spotter there, it could have been a lot worse. And that's why Peter's there. I didn't see much what happened. Well, you'll walk straight down the end, got to the safe spot, the base of the leg. As you've bent down to touch his other leg, he's swung into your direction. As you say, almost 100%. He came in your direction instead of where you touched. I was in a safe spot by prodding his back leg. I was around the base of his back leg. I prodded a couple of times, and that actually took his attention off of you. So that gave you that split second to get out of his way. That's when you've got up, moved around, I'll come back, give him a tap around the head, keep him in one spot, and give you time to get away. Thanks, Pete. I owe you my foot. <laughs> <laughs> and 50 bucks. Eh? Okay. <laughs> I've had crocodiles teeth in me 30 times in my 40 years of contact with these creatures. Now, I don't call them croc bites, I call them love bites. Because if a crocodile actually bites you, you generally don't get the bits back. And I've still got all my fingers and toes. Now, I believe it's my understanding of the killer instinct of these animals that's kept me safe to date. And to show you my understanding, I'm going to swim with Solomon here. 
He's the one that nearly killed my niece, Carla. During my 10 years at Edward River, especially during 1972 to 1979, where I was collecting eggs and catching crocodiles for the farm, I found myself in a position through breakdowns where I had to swim crocodile infested rivers. Now I had to put some real serious thought into how I was gonna do this quite safely. Now I realized that crocodiles actually hunted using their eyesight and splashing. So I slipped into the water very much like a crocodile would, not splashing, swam underwater as far as I could, came up for a breath, then did a very, very gentle breaststroke the rest of the way, not splashing. It must have worked, because I'm still here. Now, if you come with me, I'll show you. What you're about to see is a real reenactment of that swim Rob described to see if his theory holds up. Rob will actually swim with Big Solomon, who was positioned at the other end of the pond, his head facing away from Rob, his tail not more than 30 feet away. To show you that I'm master of the beast, I'm gonna swim with Solomon. When I go in, I go very gentle, so we can't feel it. Solomon is only two body lengths away and in his own element. Swim across. So far, the theory seems to be working. Not a move from the 4.5 metre, 15 foot, three quarters of a ton croc. He's up the other end. Now if I start splashing, you turn and you'll come. Solomon's interest kicks in and he's on the move. He knows there's a meal just two of his body lengths away. Here comes. This is Rob using the animal's instincts against it. And that's what Rob Reddle is all about. The splash theory, like Rob's whole life, is now a tested and proven series of experiences for survival in the wild. You'll see he can actually see me if I walk over this way, he'll follow. See if he can see, come on. And to prove to you that he was hungry, I brought him some dinner. People might say, you fed him before you did it. Saltwater crocodiles are one of the most treacherous animals on the planet. Yet this man just knowingly entered its territory. We've all heard of never smile at a crocodile. How about kissing them? When it comes to all creatures great and terrifying, it seems no one understands what lies in the heart of a killer like this man. This is Rob Brettle, and right here is where he comes face to face with the killer instinct. They are one of the world's most misunderstood creatures. Supremely adapted, they're designed by evolution to survive in the harshest conditions with honed natural talents for the hunt and kill. Feared by many, revered by others, they always evoke extreme reactions from humans and prey alike. Especially when you look into their eyes and truly see the killer instinct of snakes.
crocodile. The mere mention of its name can strike fear in the human heart. Is this because it's a vicious and violent killer? But this man can kiss crocodiles. These efficient predators outlived the dinosaurs and have deadly hunting equipment. They know a meal will walk right into their home. When that time comes, you'll see the killer instinct of crocodiles. Shark. The very word strikes fear into most of us. They are one of the most numerous and successful carnivores on Earth. At the top is the great white shark. Together with the highly intelligent killer whale, these extraordinary predators command the seas across the globe. But how do they hunt? Do they use strategy? And do they deliberately target humans? Is it just survival? Or is it all just the killer instinct of sharks? <laughs> As a killing machine, there are few wild beasts to rival these. They reign supreme over most other creatures in their domain. They are fiercely territorial and defend it aggressively. One look into the eye of the tiger, or the lion, or the cougar, is a warning. Don't mess with this cat. If you have a survival instinct, you know they have the killer instinct of the big cats. You're a small rodent, maybe an insect, and stalking you is a member of the reptilian master species. The eyes, the teeth, the jaws are designed to kill prey. The advantages that put this predator at the top of the food chain doesn't have to be speed. For the largest of this species, it's the bite that kills. Don't mistake them for Jurassic dinosaurs. They're alive and well today, surviving with a killer instinct of lizards. Like thieves in the night, they lie in wait. Camouflaged, patient, deadly. They're not even insects, they're arachnids. If you knew how many spiders were within a 25 foot radius of where you are right now, you'd probably freak. But they can play a positive role in the ecosystem. This doesn't mean you have to be any less afraid when confronted by this, or this. And not many of us can understand this. Prepare to be fascinated, repulsed and amazed as we examine the killer instinct of spiders. As the sun sets over the Australian bush, there is a sound that strikes fear. A sound that echoes in history and chills the hearts of many who have come to know its raw killing power. They hunt in packs, protect their territory, and use their wolf-like cunning and agility to run down the fastest native and domesticated animals, and occasionally, even humans. In Australia, the name for public enemy number one is the dingo because of his killer instinct. Aggression, a major key to survival. In a matter of seconds, cute and cuddly turns astoundingly vicious. Yeah. Ow, 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 ow. Related to Australia's best known icons, these mysterious fur balls live their lives fast and furious. With bad attitudes and razor teeth bared, these feisty little creatures can pack a whole lot of punch, proving that size does not matter to the carnivorous marsupials. Just the size of their killer instinct. flash of black wing, an evil raspy call, a darting glance, and an attack. They're the birds we moved in with. They adapted to us, but don't mess with the crow or the dive-bombing magpie. And don't take your eyes off that owl, because the butcher bird could still be close by. Their lilting song may hide their true intent, but they could be watching us in our backyards right now with the killer instinct of the urban birds of prey. There's pain in these waters, and it's not sharks. It's something quick, ugly, and almost invisible. 
the fear factor on Australian beaches is heard as screams of agony. These marine creatures have built up defences that use an arsenal of projectiles, hollow barbs, ribbons of pain, chemical warfare at the most ancient level. They'll take away your breath, your consciousness, your life. You won't believe what's down there to swallow you up in the killer instinct deep of ocean venom. There are very adaptable species. Swamps, trees, deserts, rainforest. Many hunt down their prey. Others lie in wait, knowing dinner will come along eventually on four legs, maybe two. Rob Riddle sticks his hands into tree trunks, desert holes, and goes headlong in a search for the long and lithe, the fanged and deadly. It's the strike or be struck world where killer instinct fuels the Australian python. Rob Brettle learned a lot of his amazing crocodile handling abilities in far northern Australia from 1972. Here he caught and bred thousands of crocs back from near extinction. And now he's going back to rekindle some old friendships and a few bad ones as he feeds, wrangles, births and catches crocodiles. He even gets in a little fishing on the way to discover it's the killer instinct that has made the crocodile built to kill.